Hello, welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm Mike Dever, founder of Brandywine Asset Management and host of today's show. My co-host is Audrey Greenberg, co-founder of Center for Breakthrough Medicines. And our guest today is Matt Pinto, faith-based investor and founder of the Genesis Group, a Catholic VC and incubator. Genesis is launching the first ever Catholic crypto conference. And Matt is going to talk with us today about the merging of faith and cryptocurrency. Uh, but before we get to Matt, I have a question for you, Audrey. Um, Hi, Mike. Welcome to the show. Yeah, it's uh, great to see you after our summer. Um, so with Center Breakthrough Medicine, you guys do a lot of real innovative things there, and you've got a bunch of innovative companies. And you know, I, the one question I keep hearing a lot about is gene therapy. And what is cell and gene therapy, and how are they different? Yeah, cell therapy is really the ability to cure cancer. So you take someone's immune cells right now, a lot of the approved therapies are in CAR T cell therapy. You um, extract via apheresis their, their cells. You genetically mod modify them to be heat seeking missiles to attack and kill their cancer. And then you infuse them back into the patient. So it's a one patient, one dose, and we're looking to sort of make that a more scalable model in the industry, but that's cell therapy, gene therapy, is uh, the use of currently the use of viral vectors to uh, those are genetically modified viruses to deliver healthy missing um, or to repair defective genes with the use of a virus. So cell therapy is more for cancer and this is very generalized and, and gene therapy is for genetic disease, but both of them are the ability uh, result in the ability to cure a previously uncurable disease. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, so what are the misconceptions you have? And, you know, I hear a lot of things about stem cells and cells and, you know, what can be used and stuff. What, what are the common misconceptions about cell and gene therapy? Yeah, I think there's a, a general um, sort of misunderstanding of, of the viral vector, right? We're not taking an active virus and using that uh, to deliver DNA. These are genetically modified viruses that really remove all the bad parts of the virus and, and are keeping the good parts of the virus, which are really the heat seeking uh, ability to really infect your body in, in a positive way. So that's the first thing. And then, um, you know, we're really at the beginning phases of cell and gene therapy. This is we have uh, decades in front of us in terms of improvements and discovery. So we're, we're really at the beginning phases of this. And then lastly, um, I, I think there's a general lack of awareness of not just in cell and gene therapy, by the way, but just in general, it can cost $2 billion and take 10 years for a drug to get approved. It's a very long time just for something from idea to commercialization. So uh, it takes longer and often costs more than, than you might plan originally. It, is there... A, 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 a relationship between what was being done with the COVID vaccines and this gene therapy, because it it seems like it just happened overnight. They were able to develop these vaccines instead, instead of taking years. Yeah, that's a great question. So the technology mm -hmm. was based on technology out of the Weissman lab at University of Pennsylvania, which is messenger RNA. RNA is an, another way to deliver, um, you know, basically a vaccine into the human body. And so that is an advanced therapy. It's a way of transforming uh, your cells in a previously, uh, in a way that, that we didn't have before. Uh, previous vaccines delivered um, uh, an active virus into your system. In this way, we're, we're just delivering a mechanism that results in a, an immune response. So it's sort of tricking your cells to believe that you have the virus and elicit an immune response. So we're really excited about some of these advanced therapies. mRNA uh, potentially can be used for cell and gene therapy. So those are things that are being investigated now. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, so what's your timeline for uh, what's happening at Discovery Labs and Center for Breakthrough Medicines, you know, this year, next year, you know, over the, what do you see happening? What do you think is uh, going to be developed? Yeah, we've made so much progress. You know, we launched the company essentially in the middle of COVID. And we're able to now we have 350 em employees. We have hundreds of thousands of square feet of labs online where we're doing work for a lot of clients. So we're happy to bring that to Philadelphia in the cell and gene therapy industry. But the future is also bright. We're continuing to get our space online. Our first viral vector suite uh, will be operational in October. 
and uh, our cell therapy, we're going to, by the way, in Viral Vector, we'll have 20 Viral Vector suites uh, once fully built and in the same amount for cell therapy. And our first cell therapy suite is coming online early next quarter. We're doing also plasmid production, which will be online before the end of this year. And our GMP plasmid capability will be online early next year. But at full scale, the Center for Breakthrough Medicines will be 700,000 square feet on the Discovery Labs campus, which now Discovery Labs has you know, three and a half million square feet over a bunch of different properties. So we have this life science hub really in King of Prussia, just you know, a short distance from downtown Philadelphia, which is quickly becoming known as Silicon Valley, where all the cell and gene therapies were really invented or, and continue to scale here. Philadelphia is a great city for uh, the ability to scale your startup, whether it's in technology or in cell and gene therapy. Yeah, so <clears throat> you, it is a great area, but um, how do you handle worker shortages? Um, you hear that across the board now. Is there is there any problem with people that are trained in the the cell therapy and gene therapy manufacturing? Uh, is it is are there enough of them in the Philadelphia area? No, it's interesting. There's this global shortage of workers. I think across multiple industries, but specifically in cell and gene therapy, because it's such a new field, it's hard to find someone that is skilled in this area. But because we're in Philadelphia, which is uh, really where cell and gene therapy was born, we have the academic institutions, which have a bunch of trained scientists. We have uh, a lot of big pharma companies and startup biotechs, for that matter, that that have trained scientists in these areas. So. We've actually not only been able to hire people locally, but we've attracted talent really from around the world uh, to our site and to our company here at Center for Breakthrough Medicines. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons, you know, just having a great culture, making sure that we have great and, and competitive benefits and policies for our employees and attractive work environment and opportunities for growth. Um, and, you know, a little bit of flexibility here as well. You know, we do work in a lab. So unfortunately, it's hard to do the work from home thing when you're working in a lab. Uh, right. But, but but yeah, it's 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 been relatively easy for us. But you're right. We need to train the next generation of talent. And if you've been, I don't know if you noticed um, in the news, like there's been a lot of recent announcements between the Chamber of Commerce and Wistar and some of these. Um, even Montgomery County Community College and Jefferson Institute of Bioprocessing, they now have these apprenticeship programs for aseptic manufacturing, which is essentially a clean room. And there's a lot of gowning requirements and cleanliness requirements when you're in these rooms. So understanding the procedures is, is very important. So a lot of training in that area. That's within the GMP lab. And then wrapped around that lab, you have all the engineers, facilities, your testing, your analytics. So a lot of heavily um, trained and skilled labor is required. But good news is uh, for Philadelphia in particular, uh, this means a great career track for a population that may not otherwise have had such a great career track. So we're able to skill and train workers um, that maybe don't have uh, high school degrees and, and, and train them in warehouse or manufacturing. And this is a great opportunity for Philadelphia. So we're happy to do that. We're, we plan to have 2,000 employees, you know, at full scale up. So we'll wow. need to yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like, I mean, it's a bit of a virtuous circle here where you're, you're building things out and that's attracting the talent. And that's creating the new talent to continue to build it out, which is which is nice. And it's great seeing this happening in, in the Philadelphia area. Um, I guess one last question. Is there an obstacle you need to overcome in Philadelphia to maintain its status uh, as a leading hub for the cell and gene therapy? Yes, I appeal to our lawmakers to please provide better benefits and funding opportunities for companies that want to relocate here or establish operations here. We're competing all the time. At Discovery Labs with other states, North Carolina, Ohio, Massachusetts, California, um, and when we're recording companies from abroad in the Middle East and in, in Europe and China that are establishing operations here. So to be able to provide a company with incentives to, to locate here is going to be key to growing our ecosystem. But I would say, you know, we have a great um, offering here in Philadelphia, so very pleased on all other accounts. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Um, so I do have a question that's related here. Uh, Mark Friedman in Philadelphia is asking, how is stem cell research developing? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And there, there's a couple different kinds of stem cells that exist. There's iPSCs and MSCs, um, and they work in different ways. Um, MSCs are really the prominent stem cell therapy right now. There's over 500 clinical trials right now taking place in, with MSCs. But unfortunately, they can only be used for certain um, things like neuro neurological symptom um, diseases, bone and cartilage like osteoarthritis and cardiovascular. So it's sort of a limited um, population that these can be applied against, whereas iPSCs really provide the ability to have war, uh, wider potential in therapeutics. So that those are the two main types of stem cells. And it's, it's the, the advancements are quite um, impressive. So you're able to uh, treat cancer and uh, genetic disease with, with some of these cells where it shows positive growth using the stem cell and regenerating tissue um, and di previously damaged brain cells and things of that nature. So very oh, pleased sure. that we're making a lot of progress in that area. Thanks well, for excellent. The well, yeah, well, thank you for the answer. And if you would like to have your question answered on Money Matters TV, Here's how you can send it in. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Okay, so Audrey, with that, we uh, would like to offer Matthew Pinto uh, a warm welcome to this week's episode of Money Matters TV. Uh, once again, Matt is a, Matt is a faith-based investor and founder of the Genesis Group, a Catholic VC and incubator. Hello, Matt. Mike, it's good to be with you. Yeah, you as well. Um, so uh, tell me briefly, what does it mean to be a faith-based investor? Uh, great question. Um, a faith-based investor is someone who's really maybe orientation in life is ultimately in the direction of issues of faith, even if he or she spent their daytime hours doing a secular job. Uh, at times it can actually merge and, and both become one, but a faith-based investor is someone who sees nonprofit or for-profit opportunities that he or she believes will, will yield great fruit, meaning be effective. Uh, often uh, we find guys, and you may have seen this in your own lives, occasionally, at least in the Catholic world, you'll, you'll have nonprofits that may not um, know that, that, that they're called to really be uh, great stewards of the resources. They may give themselves a little bit of a pass that because they're doing faith-based work, they're allowed to have maybe second-rate uh, looks or second-rate execution. It's not certainly not always the case, but um, often the case. Whereas uh, I and the people with whom I work, we would bring an approach of, of real professionalism where possible, uh, just, just all the, the efficiencies and, and all the things that would be uh, a normal business owner would be attentive to. So a faith-based investor at the end of the day is someone who, who has a, a, a calling, maybe beyond the, the here and now, and, and looks for good opportunities uh, with people who have ideas, who want to carry out those callings, again, in a nonprofit or a for-profit manner. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about your interest in crypto and how that applies to your faith-based background. Uh, good question, Audrey. I, I it, it really was just a hobby that I began maybe four years or so ago. And about a year and a half or so ago, I um, I sold a a 23-year, uh, that I found a 23-year-old Catholic publishing and media company. And so as my daily workload began to diminish, uh, I began to explore, you know, life in general. And, and I took up the crypto interest again. And really, uh, I'm less into crypto, and I am, as much as I am a dot connector in the Catholic world. I, I really love this work. I would do it for free, and much of my former staff would have done it for free. We all have bills, so we couldn't do it for free. Um, but the interest... Uh, was to see what this could mean for the church. 
the conference that I'm running that maybe we can touch on at the end is uh, is really an attempt to bring uh, finance people, crypto people, technologists together with theologians, philosophers, and what we call in the Catholic world, pastoral ministers, those who are doing the work in the field for two days to, to ask questions. And so, and the final point is the reason why I started to noodle on this was in 1994 and 95 and 96, when I was involved with Catholic ministry, the internet came into the world and the church, whom I love, the church really was five to eight to 10 years behind in really embracing the internet. There were some things happening and the Pope even wrote, um, a letter in 1995 about the internet, but it wasn't necessarily aggressively happening. So my hope and goal here is to not have that happen again. I think blockchain, crypto, NFTs, and a number of other derivatives, Web3, really have the chance of being very big. So my hope is to see if the church can really leverage this for the common good. I, I do want to get back to the uh, the, the conference you, you mentioned, but in in the interim here, and as a Catholic entrepreneur, what does that mean? Um, are you able to mix the the sacred, the Catholic side, and the secular side? Uh, are there things off limits? Is it something like ESG? Um, what exactly yeah. do you mean? Yeah, I mean that that's that's a good analogy. Um, the answer is it's tricky business at times. One always needs to guard. Uh, again, his or her heart to make sure that motives are, are oriented properly. We would view the, Catholics would view the, the temporal world, the financial world as goods, uh, all created things, uh, except that they're clearly designed for evil, are, are good. We look at the world as good. And um, so, so the, the thought is that these two can absolutely merge in fact, uh, Mike and, and Audrey, I would say that if one learns how to master coming up to the edge of, of ethical issues and maybe greed and things like that, but if one learns to master that in a faith context it, versus shunning it from the word go out of fear, I think you're actually exhibiting greater virtue. If, if you can understand what the danger is, you can come up to the point of, of being a great steward and maximizing something without it it overtaking, that is probably to me a greater virtue than falling into default shun mode. And, and the church, believe it or not, would actually call us to that. And I won't get too fancy on us here theologically, but there's an, a really fabulous parable, the parable of the talents. And we hear about three metaphorical persons, one who had one talent, one who had three, and one who had five. And a talent was a, a measure of, of, of wealth. And the one out of fear of losing it buried that talent. The, the one with three and the one with five uh, increased their, their talents. And the Lord praised the two who increased and rebuked the one who out of fear buried it. And they buried it out of fear, they said in, in, in this particular verse in scripture, because they knew that he was a, 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 a taskmaster and, and would expect much and didn't want to lose it. So I've, I've reflected on the parable of the talents many times over the years, knowing that mixing of the sec sacred and the secular can be a little dangerous. But because of that rebuke, I'm choosing to try and be one of the three or one of the five. Yeah, I, I would think, especially in the crypto world, where there's just so much going on that's underhanded almost, you could say. And uh, so you, you have to be very careful. And, and obviously, if you can get in there and provide a sort of a safe haven uh, for for people that that could add uh, a lot of value uh, in, in crypto yeah. space. Yeah, I think so. Um, people were asking me, what is the purpose of the conference? And there, there's, a, and again, we can talk about it later, but it still makes your point now, safe haven. It's an offensive reason, a defensive reason, and then a third reason. The offensive reason is, is there something good here? Again, the world, uh, the church views the world as good or morally neutral. It's at least morally neutral, if not good. Is there something good here that we can leverage for, in our case, the sake of the gospel, but also for the common good? The defensive is, can the church have a seat at the table to mitigate misuses? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the church does have a worldview. Um, even those who disagree with the worldview respect at times that at least it has a framework. And we do have a clear moral framework. We uh, Principles of like the ends are never justified by the means. 
and and one must always pursue the good and principles like that. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it does become a safe haven. And um, one of the talks we're going to be doing at the conference is this very issue of hacks and scams and how to how mm -hmm. to avoid falling prey to them. And what about technology? How what's the view on technology? How do how do you guys how do Catholics view that? Another case, perhaps. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is it's at least morally neutral, if not a good, and it's usually a good. In fact, um, Audrey, we would use this phrase that any creative action, whether it's an idea in your head or the life sciences creations, as long as they're serving the common good, and and we would say are not uh, using illicit means to achieve a good ends because we would say although it looks like the good ends outweigh it, it we would always have to be attentive to the illicit means um because we don't know where those stray bullets of illicit means will end up you know metaphorically you know so the church would say uh, that that we are to use our god-given gifts we are to be good stewards of our person of our minds our intellects and our wills and and we are to pursue those with the common good in mind um, I'm not sure that there's any technology that in and of itself is evil. It's, it's ultimately how it's used. Right. Okay. So I guess the same answer really would apply to how do Catholics view business in general or the free market and economics? Yeah. Yeah. Many people would be uh, surprised. Um, there, there's an entity called the Acton, A-C-T-O-N, the Acton Institute. Uh, named after a Lord Acton in England. And the Catholic position would absolutely fall on the side of the free market and capitalism. In fact, there's a famous quote by, I believe it's Pius XII about 70 or 80 years ago, where he said that a Catholic can't be a socialist. And, uh, and the reason being is because ultimately it tampers and stifles the human spirit. We were meant for freedom. We were meant for creativity. We were meant for communion. And, and anything that, that really cuts that off at the knees would be contrary to human thriving and human nature. So we would say that, that it absolutely aggressively leans in the direction of free market, but it tempers it. It softens some of the edges. For example, the dollar is not the, the primary ends. It, it's 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 the pursuit, but it has to be attentive to the human person. So therefore, an employer, for example, would would need to uh, factor in, um, you know, the life situation of the person and creating a hum uh, a humane environment where uh, the human spirit can ultimately thrive. Will that thrive in the metaverse? One of my friends <laughs> recently started a job as chief metaverse officer, and I saw that on LinkedIn pop up, and I thought, what is that? What? what it, tell me more about the metaverse, what you know about that and Web 3.0, and how yeah, does that yeah. apply to all of this other stuff? <laughs> yeah, first off, great question. Um, so, so we would say that the human person, um, Mike, you and I are friends. Audrey, we're new friends. Uh, you and your spouses, you were made for communion. The human person was actually made for a self-donation. And in that self-donation, you actually receive the other. It's a beautiful uh, symmetry that is designed. At no point can we use the uh, see the other person as a means to an end. We can't use people. Uh, you now, you can mutually agree upon business, but you can't use them as a means to an end. So how we how this would carry over into the metaverse is we would say that just like a newspaper, a newspaper uh, is not as human as you speaking to me to find out the news in, in Chester County. That would be more communal. However, we would all agree that a newspaper is fine uh, and a book is fine. And this internet medium we're using right now is fine. In fact, we have richer communion here than we would maybe on the phone or, you know, uh, through other means. So this is a big, long-winded way of saying that the church, we don't even know what the metaverse is yet. It's going to be some type of um, richer immersion into the artificial intelligence world. Uh, it's probably not going to be as immersive as we're fearing with the glasses, everyone walking out, around with the glasses. It's probably going to be like you use your the Internet. You're going to bop in and bop out of it in a given day. We would say it's a problem if if that's really where it ends, because we were we were made for communion, common union with each other in a really in an enfleshed type of way. So 
we should keep an eye on it. We should have a seat at the table. We should tamp it back when it when it's going too far. If persons are living their full lives in it, it's a fundamental problem. It's anti-human, um, but it does have a place in the created world. I I would contend, although we don't fully know what it will be yet. But um, that's that's a, that's the sense of uh, of those who are commenting on it from a Christian worldview perspective, Judeo-Christian perspective. Yeah, I, I guess you would end up with, with communities in the metaverse, just like you have communities in reality, right? That you'd have Catholic communities and, you know, faith-based communities as well. Yes, yes. But, but we would say, but that can only take us so far. For example, uh, forgive me for getting the link, but the conjugal union between man and woman, well, that that has to be in the manner that it is. Uh, we would also say, for example, in Catholicism, we have something called the Eucharist, but we call it the real presence. We actually believe something fairly radical uh, there. And so you couldn't have a metaverse communion because you're not receiving the real presence of we, what we believe is God himself, which is crazy for those who aren't familiar with that. Um, so only to a certain extent does it make sense, but it probably will be a useful tool and someone just shared the other day, and forgive me for going on here, but 98% of us are never going to go to the Sistine Chapel, or 90% um, of us are never going to make it to the National you know, uh, Gallery you know, in, in New York. But what if we could have a fully immersive experience there where we're li you know, literally seeing it as you would see it? And then we could do something that individuals can't do. We can fly up and see a close-up of the touching of you know the 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 famous creation image in the Sistine Chapel, so it really has a chance of enriching the human spirit, even from our perspective, enriching the whole question of evangelization, because uh, you can reach people in unique ways. But ultimately, it has its limits. So tell us more about this upcoming conference. It's targeted at Catholics, I would imagine, or is it open to all? I'm Jewish, just asking for for yeah. a friend. Yeah, yeah, no. About a third of our speakers, uh, in, including uh, two from the uh, uh, Jewish tradition, uh, will be presenting. About a third of our speakers are non-Catholic. I, I, you know, was having fun, but was serious when I said to a number of presenters, listen, you not only not need to be Catholic, you don't even need to like the church. But if you can speak on NFTs in a professional manner, that's what we need. So um, it's absolutely open to everyone. In fact, I would say to you guys, when you hear the phrase Catholic crypto conference, just decide to project onto it the Jewish crypto conference, <laughs> the evangelical crypto conference, the non-believer crypto conference. Sure, there'll be 10, 15, 20 percent of talks that will clearly be tying the two together. Uh, but the majority, 70 plus percent of our presentations are uh, on the industry itself. Well, that's great. We, uh, Matt, we really appreciate your time on the show. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, something we, we don't have faith based investing. It's not something that we've had on the show. And uh, it, it, I, I can see how there's a there's a place for it. It's important. Um, we, we appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us. That's great, guys. Thanks for having yeah. me. And there's some really thoughtful questions there. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> OK. Um, our next guest on Money Matters TV is Wendy Eldridge of Markham Wealth. And we'd like to thank you for watching Money Matters, where your money matters. See you next time. Mm -hmm.